panel has its origins in a workshop held by Chris. I'm going to say a few words about Chris in a moment. Last November. The workshop was funded by NMO Plus Research Programme in the UK. This is a research programme about the digital economy. And they especially wanted the CRISP Research Centre to explore a research agenda on this topic area. So um, my colleagues here this morning, Professor Kirsty Borden and Professor Charles Brown, are going to take a few notes because we're developing this research agenda and we'll be writing a research call which we're going to hand back to the NMO Plus Research Programme back in the UK. Okay, so this panel, if you like, is a second stepping stone in the development of that research agenda. So the panel today is hosted by CRISP. CRISP is the Centre for Research into Information Surveillance and Privacy. It's a research centre shared between the University of Stirling, University of Edinburgh and the OU. It's an interdisciplinary research centre with a core aim of um, generating and disseminating new knowledge about information surveillance and privacy. The three directors of the research centre are here today, myself, Professor William Webster, Professor Kirsty Ball, is sitting at the front, and Professor Charles Rad, who's one row back. Um, okay, we also have handed out, which you will have seen, a uh, digital footprint, which has got a few bits of information about the research centre, how to contact us. I've been asked to point out that the, uh, the Twitter address is wrong on here. You'll find the correct Twitter address on our website, of course, but the correct Twitter address, if you're tweeting, is Chris. O U B S. Twitter at Chris O U B S. Anyway, um, okay, let me introduce the panel. Okay, as I've already said, my name is Professor William Webster from the University of Stirling in Scotland, one of the directors of CRISP. I'm based in the management school. I'm an expert in CCTV public policy and practice, um, and I've been involved with a number of research pro projects and programmes where surveillance is the main element of the research being conducted including Living in Surveillance Societies and the IRIS Research Project, which it features heavily during this conference. I'm just going to say a very few words about each of our panellists, just to save time. Um, if they want to say a bit more about their backgrounds, they can do so when they start to talk. I'm, I'll be very brief. OK, so we have on my, my right as I speak, um, the, your left as you look at me, my left as you look at me, uh, we have a number of speakers. I'll go in order in which they're presenting. OK, so we have Dr John Borking over here. He is uh, currently the director of the Walking Consultancy, but he's known to many of us as the previous vice president and privacy commissioner of the Dutch Data Protection Authority. Um, I'll just be brief just to save a bit of time, we're running a little bit late, so I'll move on. Um, he's going to speak first. We're going to be followed, it's going to be followed by uh, Tom Elou. Oh, I hope I pronounced that right. In the right territory. Right, okay. <laughs> My apologies. As soon as I said it, I realised oh, I should have checked that. Right, okay. Um, he's, he's, uh, he's been involved in a number of companies uh, working around privacy, including the Cool Credit Consumer Markets, uh, Garlic, and Egg. He's also served on the ITU, the Geneva based UN agency, on the and on the high level expert group on cybercrime, and he's chairman of the UK Technology Strategy Board's Network Security. Innovation platform. That's what I'm for. I read it out word for word. Okay, um, our next speaker is uh, Casey Chappelle. Is that spelled? Is that That's it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, she's the, I've got this from the internet, so the good old, good old Google. <laughs> Global Privacy Council for Vodafone Group, um, expert in consumer privacy and regulatory law. Okay, and um, Following Casey, we have Dr. Jason Pridmore. He is based at the Department of Media and Communications at Erasmus University, Rotterdam, and has research interests in consumer surveillance and identity management. The moderator for this panel is Professor Jeff Boker. Is that pronounced right? Close enough. Oh, man. In the church. I should have checked before I was a speaker this morning. Based at the School of Information and Computer Science, University of California. Um, interested in a range of uh, research areas, uh, including the Smart Society Project. Published a number of interesting books that you might be familiar with, including Sorting Things Out, which is quite a well-known book, and Memory Practices in the Sciences, I believe, is the more, most recent book. Jeff is our moderator this morning. Now, the idea behind the panel was we have this topic area, commercialising uh, commercialization of privacy, and what we try to do is we try to build in different perspectives. So we will have some, we're going to have one perspective, which is the regulatory perspective, a consumer perspective, and a business perspective. So these perspectives are meant to offer different angles around this topic area. 
um, and hopefully that will lead to a, you know, a, lively, a lively panel and hopefully some, some interesting discussion. So I think on that note I should, I should be quiet and we'll move on to the presentations. John is first and hopefully this is where we start doing our sign language to get the... You have to warn you. Okay. No so I'm Jim Borton, uh, I'm a production program uh, for, for the for my workshop. This is the end of my presentation, thank you. <laughs> so I have to catch up. Um, what I want to show you to you is uh, just uh, what is understood by privacy by design uh, and as it is now um, mentioned in the general data protection uh, regulation. Uh, but I don't go into the reality. Then I made a timeline, the timeline where you see some developments about the privacy by design. And, and um, I will show you, I will show you also some economic considerations in the very short time we have. Um, the, the, yes, that's, that's the menu. So the next one, what is privacy by design? Um, from a, a legalistic and a linguistic point of view, the word by means that uh, proposedly data protection has to be realized by design. And I think we are encountering as mankind a total new uh, area. We, as, as mankind, have always made uh, for a very long time tools and machines, and they were primarily expressing ourselves and writing ourselves like a reek in a huge in the garden is an extended arm with fingers. But for the first time in, in mankind's history, we are trying to implement ethical principles in machines and in information systems. And that is, uh, is a, a totally new development in, in mankind. Um, the uh, definitions about privacy design differ a little bit, but there is a, it's a nice description in the um, report from the Wharton Article 29 party it states that uh, the application of such a principle would emphasize the, the need to implement privacy-enhanced technologies, uh, um, privacy by default service, and tools that will enable the user to protect better. So in fact, privacy by design will give the user, the consumer, the, the data subject, tools to protect its privacy better. Um, going to the, the next one, the timeline. Um, People ask me, uh, what is, this, is this the next slide? Is the positive? Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, is this one? Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, next, um, it, it's, a, it's a timeline which very briefly given some development. Um, uh, people ask me when started this all. And um, uh, when I joined the Dutch Data Protection Authority in 1994, early, we found out that uh, there was little respect for the Dutch Data Protection Act. It was only uh, valid uh, in force about five years, and uh, also the, the Dutch Data Protection Authority had no, no, we didn't get any respect. And the reason was that they were seen as not uh, as being marginal uh, for society. Then we did a. Um, I came from the industry, and uh, I was used to do SWOT analysis. So we did the SWOT analysis, the strengths, weaknesses, uh, opportunity, threats uh, analysis for this organization. And we came to some embarrassing conclusions, but one of the conclusions was that uh, instead of uh, being passive and waiting until uh, complaints were uh, 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 sent to us by the, um, by the data subjects and by the consumers, we had to develop remedies. Uh, and remedies in, in two uh, sense, and one uh, a, a branch of, of uh, privacy enhanced technologies, and the other one would be uh, the privacy audit systems. So we could see uh, people who really adhere to our, to our legislation. Um, the, the SWOT result in the research, together with the um, Dutch Applied Technology uh, Laboratories, TNL, uh, and later joined by the uh, um, Canadian uh, Information uh, and Privacy Commissioner, uh, and we uh, published the report in uh, 1995. Uh, and it was also presented at the, at the Data Commission's uh, International Data Commission's Conference in Copenhagen. The report gave um, uh, three basic design principles. It, uh, it uh, contained also six uh, privacy enhanced uh, architectures, uh, models, and the, the three uh, privacy by design um, principles were the introduction of identity protector, 
uh, that would um, uh, uh, protect the uh, the uh, identity of the of the data subject. Um, we introduced uh, the split up of information systems in identity domains, uh, particularly in identity domains where the data uh, the data um, subject was unknown or uh, was used absolute identity or uh, total anonymity. And the other principle was that uh, protection need to be done at the moment of the data collection, not later. So uh, immediately protection was the best way to, um, at, the, at the moment of collection, to protect the data. Then, um, uh, when we had uh, done all the, the theoretical <coughs> research that was proved by many um, uh, universities as, as being correct, based on work from David Chow, cryptographic uh, work, um, we said now we have to prove it. Uh, uh, even the pudding is the, the, the proof of the pudding. And so in uh, 1996 uh, and 1997, uh, um, a hospital information system had be, was built by ICL and uh, a subsidiary of it, Isaac. And they worked for the, for the medical sector and they uh, built a hospital information system for a big psychiatric hospital based on the principles as mentioned in the uh, report, the research price enhanced technology, the path to anonymity. You can still find it on the, the website of the Dutch Data Protection uh, Authority. Um, and we, what also was the result of the sort was that we, we thought that the Data Protection Authority didn't know what really was going on in the society. And so we did every year a technology assessment. And one of the technology assessments was uh, the start of a new project called PISA. PISA is the Privacy Incorporated Software Agent. We had the strongly the impression, not only as lawyers, I'm a lawyer for profession, but as a lawyer that the data protection legislation is so complex that in fact it's impossible for the data circuit to protect itself according to the rules. And even for the controllers that have to um, uh, uh, handle the data according to the legislation is too complex legislation. So we invented a privacy software, uh, software incorporated software agent that could uh, protect the privacy of, uh, um, of the data subject. And that worked uh, very well. It was, by the way, inspired by um, a clip, a video clip from Apple when they introduced the, the privacy uh, digital assistant in. Uh, 1987, and when you realize what that um, uh, uh, digital virtual can do, then you suddenly realize that there's an enormous problem uh, in the privacy field. Um, due to our uh, research in 2001, uh, it was realized by uh, Mark Hansen from the uh, Data Commission um, uh, office in Kiel, in Germany, that uh, student identities meant very many student identities for every individual, and therefore we needed to build uh, privacy um, uh, uh, identity uh, systems and, and, and uh, access to identity systems to, to manage all our student identities. In the meantime, there was a lot of work from uh, the uh, W3C uh, group, uh, the worldwide uh, uh, web uh, group, um, uh, and they developed a, a privacy language, a privacy preference language, that uh, enabled uh, people uh, which have a web to express their privacy policy in, an, uh, in a standardized way, and also for data users who are um, who are visiting these websites to express their privacy preferences, so that it was a, a common understanding of what the user, the, the, the visitor of the website, really wanted to do with his data or not, and that helped us again to develop further uh, systems. Uh, the, the PISA project was very successful, and uh, but we touched upon a new phenomenon, and it was that if you want to teach machines to to, to handle uh, data according to the privacy legislation, the privacy policies, the machine has to understand the privacy world, like we understand the privacy world. So we had to uh, create uh, what they call privacy anthologies for machines in a readable, for machine readable way, so the machine would understand what, for example, is meant with transparency or uh, a purpose binding or consent. Uh, that was a very, very difficult task because as a lawyer, I never uh, realized what it meant that the machine could understand um, how to deal with these rules. You, uh, 
and uh, we ended up in uh, in a speech labs, a laboratory labs also from uh, from the university here in um, in, in Brussels, uh, where we were taught how it was possible that we, <coughs> the human beings, uh, do understand each other. Because I speak to you, but uh, probably at the best at the best possibility, only eight percent is understood by you by my words. All the other basic uh, thoughts around it are filled in by yourself. And this we have to mimic also in a computer system, which was very difficult. In the meantime, we have developed uh, a fast privacy uh, ontology library. Prime was the next uh, research project uh, financed by the uh, Commission. And um, they really uh, started to, um, to prove that with uh, the right tools, you could protect privacy almost in any uh, situation in society, provided you have the right cryptographic uh, tools. Uh, and uh, it, it's such a fast project. I could talk about the hours about this. I won't do that. But there, is still, there are still websites. You really should see this. There's a, a, a vast. Uh, a repository also of uh, programming on it, uh, of, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of, of privacy and enhancing technology, so it's, it's free for all, it's open source. Uh, and then in the end, we ended up with uh, a new development, and then one of the inventors is here, is uh, Jan Jan Hoekman. Uh, we believe that till yet we built machines um, uh, what you could call uh, custom-made. It was uh, some kind of an old couture, I would say. Uh, every system is really sort very well and nicely designed and works well, but it costs you not a lot of money. And so the, the next step is what we want to do is, would it be possible to create privacy by design on um, a, a, a ready-to-wear basis? A like we say in, in, the, in French or in the Dutch, it's a perfection. It is a, it's something you, you buy in your shop and you use certain kind of building blocks to build the right price by design system. Um, I can't go very deep into it. Um, it is basically, um, it means that we work around um, eight archetypal uh, privacy by design uh, strategies. Uh, we minimize, we hide, we separate, we aggregate, we inform, control, enforce, and demonstrate. These are the building blocks around which we want to build a ready-to-wear system. And my last slide, if I'm allowed to do that, is uh, share sorry. the slides. So, sorry. Could you share the slides? Oh, sure. Yes. Yep. Ah, that's sorry. the problem. Uh, uh, how this is? This are the the, um, the economic questions we put forward as well. I did research in that too so about four years time. We we believe I was frustrated. That is that we know now, technically speaking, we can solve almost any price problem given we have a, a, the right amount of money. But uh, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't take off. So we discovered that we were in a problem that although technology is there, people are not willing to use it. And what's the reason for that? And the next slide will show you what the reason is. This is a very famous curve. I didn't know as a lawyer that this existed. But this is the curve of, of Rogers. Rogers found out when he was uh, investigated in the United States why people didn't use fertilizers and tractors, all, all, although they already were for 40 years on the market, that there is an adoption problem. And the adoption problem means that it takes time before a technology and innovation will be accepted by society. Um, we also found the factors, uh, what are the factors exactly, the elements, that will lead to adoption of uh, privacy by design. And <coughs> read the last slide. The final the final this, what? this formula has been developed also in the research. We need, in order to convince shareholders and board of directors, you need to show that there is also a technical positive effect on implementing privacy by design technologies. And, and, um, and this is a very simple formula based on the return on investment formula. It's a well-known uh, formula in um, the financial world. We found out that if we apply this, this formula, as it stands here, it's easily to show, in a, in a rough, on a rough basis, um, what will be the, um, the return on investment on any privacy by design investment. And one of the best results we, uh, we found was uh, with the search machine XQuick, which is a meta search machine that uh, was teetering in uh, 
in 2005 hardly any uh, visits on their website. Then they implemented privacy by design uh, technologies. And within a year, they had millions of hits on their site. And if you um, calculate what the result is of the, the many hits on this site, it's a, it's a very privacy safe site. It has also a skin that is privacy safe. Um, then you can uh, calculate what was the return of investment. And the first investment they did was not very much, about 500,000 uh, euros. The return of investment after one year was more than 600%. Uh, percent. It's all documented in the, in the last slide. You see um, a very limited list, reference list. And there you can find all what I told you. Okay. Um, you can email me after the panel if you want to get copies of my other slides. So, um, my email address is on the uh, postcard, by the way. Okay, so okay, so I've taken the blue one. Okay. That, that, uh, sorry, I, I only refer to, um, as, as my time is over, that there is, the last slide is, this, uh, is, a, is a simple reference slide, and obviously what I told you is documented in here, but it's, of course, much, much more uh, literature available. Thank you. Okay, we need to move on to our next speaker. Um, this is this one. Oh, uh, this yes. Yeah. Okay, my name is Tom Ilube. I am a startup guy. Um, I create companies. I go out and pitch to venture capital guys. I try and raise money, I build companies, I sell them, I make money or I lose money, and then I do it again. I've done it about five times, I'll keep doing it, sometimes making money, sometimes losing money. Um, one of the things I remember a few years ago, one of the US venture capital guys said to me when I was pitching a privacy-based idea to him was that there is a lot of roadkill on the privacy highway. Um, these guys have seen privacy ideas come, they've, pitched, they've had them pitched to them, they've put money into them, uh, those ideas have fallen on their face, they've lost money, and that hurts the next generation of guys coming along and pitching ideas to them. But despite that, we're still looking at privacy ideas, and I'm looking at a few uh, at the moment. So I just wanted to share some thoughts with you from the perspective of an entrepreneur who's trying to pitch privacy ideas, trying to raise money to build privacy businesses. This company that I'm running now, Crossword, is a tech transfer company. So what we do is we work with universities who are doing research in areas of privacy, cybersecurity, and so forth. Um, we look for ideas that they're interested in commercializing, and then we do a commercial deal or a tech transfer deal, turn it into a product or a company, and get it out to market. As part of doing that, we've looked at every university in the UK to see what research they're doing in cybersecurity or privacy. There's about 320 projects uh, that have consumed something like 150 million pounds uh, of grant money in areas of cybersecurity and privacy. We have that in an online uh, database that's really easy to search and so forth. So if you're interested at any point in browsing that, then just send me an email and uh, I'll, I'll give you access to it and you can see what's going on. But if we focus on the privacy ones, there are 26 projects that we've found that are privacy related in UK universities, coming out of 18 universities, and there's been about 30 million euro uh, invested in them uh, over the last few years. And they cover all sorts of areas, crypt cryptography, other things, sociological aspects, cloud, consumer, B2B. Um, they range from sort of 30k projects up to 3 million euro uh, type of projects. And one of the interesting things about the funding is that in the, the two years, 2009-2010, there was about 3 million euros of funding went into these projects. In 2011-12, uh, about 10 million euros went into these projects. So that's interesting from my point of view because um, there was a real step up, and I guess it was driven by the adoption of privacy by design resolutions in 2010, and then academics said, right, let's, let's do research in that area. What it means, though, because most of those projects are sort of three to five year projects, the results of those projects are starting to emerge this year, next year, the year after. So there's sort of a wave of privacy-related research that's coming to fruition that could be commercialized if you can tackle it in the right way over the next couple of years. And that's really interesting for people thinking about how to commercialize uh, privacy uh, ideas. 
Some of the ideas are really interesting. Um, some of them are introducing new terms to me. So uh, Newcastle University, for example, is doing a project uh, which is partly under the label of what they call hyper-privacy. So what they're interested in looking at is um, areas where a, con a consumer group uh, has an extreme need for privacy. And in their case, they're looking at uh, domestic violence and people who are in a domestic violence situation who are looking for information to help them in that situation, but even browsing at home or whatever and leaving a footprint on their computer that they've been and looked at this site or that site uh, in a domestic violence context could cause them a real problem. So how do you tackle privacy in, in that context to give people like that, though, that, in that situation tools? Now one of the interesting things if you're looking at commercializing things, and particularly if you're an entrepreneur looking at startup stuff, is rather than look at the mainstream, it's smarter to look at the margins. What's going on in the extreme situations? Almost, what are the power users? What are the people who have a real need for privacy? What are they doing? Look at those ideas, and then try and bring those ideas back into the mainstream. And you see this over and over again in, in research that people do. Look at the edge, and what's going on there, and bring it back into the mainstream. So I think that's a place to look for potential ideas that could be commercialized. One of the challenges we have as people who are trying to commercialize privacy, particularly in the startup domain, and it may be different in the corporate sector, is the venture capital mindset. So I've pitched to a lot of VC guys in, in my career. Over the last 15 years, I've probably pitched to maybe 200 uh, different venture capitalists, investors in UK, Europe, uh, US. I've flown across the Atlantic, gone into a meeting room, uh, pitched for five minutes and the guys say we're not interested get out and I get on the plane and fly back again <laughs> I've pitched the same idea to a 200 people at the same time in a hall um, you know I've done it over and over again what you find at the moment is that the, priv the venture capital mindset in terms of investing is a big data mindset so you look at the pitches particularly the consumer pitches that, that these guys are listening to and if you strip it all away, the pitches is the same pitch over and over again. You basically, people are going in and saying, I'm going to do X. The result of doing X is that I will collect lots of information about people, and then I'll sell that information. And the venture capital guys nod their heads and say, yep, we get that. That's an idea we understand. You know, here's loads of money. Well, they don't actually say that, but theoretically, they, they say that. Uh, and a prime example of that would be... Um, you know, what's, it sort of gets more and more personal, so you may have come across a company called 23andMe. Um, it will, um, you, you say, it, they'll send you a test tube, you give them some saliva, you send it back, they'll analyze your DNA, they'll send you a bunch of results uh, about your DNA, they'll, they'll keep the information, uh, and their business model is the things they can do with that information. And they have all sorts of privacy policies wrapped around it, but at its heart, you could imagine the initial pitch, which was, yeah, you know, people are keeping people's browsing habits. We're going to collect their DNA sequence, and we're going to collect it and hold it, and we're going to, and the VC say, wow, that's the sort of pitch we understand. And so far, those guys have raised just about 112 million dollars of venture funding, a staggering amount of venture funding. So if you've got 50 people who pitch like that, and you're number 51, and you go in and say, I've got an idea, I'm gonna build this business, and the business is gonna ensure that consumers' privacy is protected, and that those consumers have complete control over their information. The VCs are sitting there saying, are you speaking Swahili? Why are you, you just, I don't understand what you're saying. You know, and, you, and then they say, ah, oh, I get it. And then you're going to cheat them and sell their information. <laughs> you say, no, no, no. You're actually, you're actually going to let them have control. Wow, that's, in, that's an interesting concept. How are you going to make money? Well, maybe we can get the consumers to pay. So you go back and you talk to the consumers and you say to the consumers, "You all care about privacy, don't you?" And they say, "Yes, yes, we really, we really care about privacy, and you know, it really matters to you. Yes, it really matters to you. Uh, to us. So, um, so would you pay for it?" Hey, you want us to pay for privacy? Yeah, and then suddenly the consumers say, no, no, yeah, we, we, we don't actually want to pay. We care a lot, but we won't hand over any money. So it's a tough business to go and pitch privacy, consumer privacy startup ideas to VCs. We have a real problem there. And one of the things before we really break through there is shifting the investor mindset about uh, this area. Otherwise, the money just won't go into this area for starting businesses. 
Where are we looking? We're looking in uh, uh, several areas, but mostly around privacy, consumer information privacy, or, or yeah, privacy related to people within the business uh, domain. So there's a lot of interest in the business domain about how you protect uh, the consumer information that you're holding, because um, yeah, the, the chief executives have realized they could get fired. If that, if that information uh, is exploited in some way, then they could get fired, they lose their job, they lose the flashy car, etc., etc. So suddenly they're interested in it. So you have to sort of go after quite basic uh, needs. And there's some interesting work going on at Bristol University in some areas of cryptography called multi-party computation that we're really interested in. There's some interesting thoughts of where we're working with some guys at uh, Warwick University who are doing some work around um, how you know, the blockchain that underpins uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, not the currencies themselves, but the blockchain that underpins that, what role that might have in the privacy domain and how that could be used uh, more widely. Uh, and there are other areas, as I said, and uh, as I said, if any of you are interested in browsing uh, the database, then just let me know and I'll, I'll give you access. Um, so just to summarize, um, there's a wealth of privacy concepts in research coming out and particularly over the next one or two years because of a spike in investment uh, in privacy research that happened certainly in the UK and I imagine in other countries around sort of 2010, 2011 and that, that research is coming to fruition over the next few years. I would suggest looking at the margins, looking at concepts, almost adopting that concept of hyper-privacy. Where, where does privacy really, really matter and what research is being done in those areas, what opportunities are there, and how can those ideas be brought back into the mainstream. VC funding, until the investors really shift their mindset about privacy-related businesses, it is going to be tough, tough, tough to get money out of those guys to back pure privacy plays, particularly in the consumer sector, because they just don't believe it. They don't understand it, they don't believe it, their mindset is big data, collect everything, sell the data. Um, the opportunities that we see are at this stage more in going to businesses that have a need for privacy, um, either privacy of their own employees or privacy of their, their customers and clients because they don't want to get sacked. The boss guys don't want to get sacked and they're the guys who might spend some money uh, in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Um, let's just any points of clarification. Okay, let's move on to That's me. It's got me so what I'm going to talk about are some of the areas where we've been able to create good examples of privacy by design. I'm going to talk about two products in particular that I'm very proud of. Um, and then I want to talk about how we got there. And I actually want to talk about some of the pitfalls and how we got there. The first is um, net perform. If you're a Vodafone customer, if, you, if you've got an Android phone, you can download this and play around with it. What this does is collects device and network analytics that we Vodafone but find very useful in identifying the ways in which our network is not performing and could be improved. Now, obviously, collecting these kinds of the, these pieces of data could be very privacy intrusive. It includes things like your location and the phone that you're on and the apps that you're using, whether you're on Wi-Fi, whether you're on the network. Um, what we decided to do was give that all back to you, right? So NetReform is a useful application for us if you install it, but it's also a useful application for you. If you decide to install it, purely opt-in, you can turn it on and off at any time. You can get some pretty extensive information about how it all works. <coughs> and then you can see the information back. You can, you can tell what it's collecting because it's all provided to you right there. Um, when it comes to us, it's anonymized at the device level before it comes to us. And then it's aggregated before we use it. So at the point where we get it, the privacy concerns have been stripped away because we only see it in aggregated form. We see how our network is operating generally rather than what you on your individual device have done. Um, I want to talk about a second. Now, well, that's a good example of privacy by design embedded in a product that we are, that isn't a privacy <coughs> product itself, right? What you won't see on here are things like terms and conditions, right? You've already signed up for a set of terms and conditions and privacy policy when you become a Vodafone customer. We didn't feel the need to create additional layers of legal compliance. There's no 
check box, check the box, or uncheck the box. There's no read our expensive privacy policy and that, things like that, right? That, those things are handled elsewhere. What I wanted to get to here was purely <coughs> interaction with a product that achieved privacy because you understood intuitively how it was working because of the way that the product was built. That, that's the essence of privacy by design for somebody like me. Um, the second product I want to talk about is, is this is actually privacy as a product, right? This is something that we're going to be launching this year in the UK. It's the information manager. It's your interface with Vodafone and how Vodafone is collecting your information and the place where you can make choices about how Vodafone uses that information in ways that are unrelated to the core services. So you get access to it, you learn a little bit about how it works, and then you can interact with it to make choices. This is about permissions, this is about consents, this is about things like whether we can use your information to tailor the, um, the Vodafone offers that we give to you, whether you give us consent to use your information for third party offers that you might be interested in, things like mobile analytics, things like using your location, all of the things that ordinarily you'd see in a privacy policy, and you'll still see those in a privacy policy, obviously, because we have a legal obligation to, to show you a privacy policy. But we wanted to pull it out of the policy and give you an interactive tool that allows you to understand more about what Vodafone has about it and how it's being used and to make um, more meaningful choices about what happens there. I don't want to get too far into the details. I have a demo. It's not live yet, but um, if you're interested in seeing more about it, I can pull up the demo and, and show it to you and play around with it a little bit if you want to after the session. Now, I think that's it. Yeah. Um, I'd love to be able to say that these products were developed because we created a, an, an internal product development process that embedded good privacy by design in it. But I, I'd be lying, right? These products were developed because I worked really closely with the product teams over several months to, in the case of information managers, several years to get us to the right point where the people who were developing these programs were thinking about privacy in the right way. And it, you know, it, it's an approach that maybe works, but it's not scalable, right? The ideal way to achieve that would be to embed privacy in your product development lifecycle with a set of rules that software developers are, are you know, can understand and, and can program towards. But, you know, unfortunately, privacy doesn't always work that way. My, this is my favorite quote recently about privacy. A, a columnist in The Guardian called it both viciously complex and floatingly abstract. Now, software developers are really comfortable with the first concept, they're really uncomfortable with the second one. And if when you talk to them and you start to talk about things like social norms and behavioral economics and political philosophy and all of the things that, you know, those of us who spend all of our time thinking about privacy are really interested in and comfortable talking about it, their eyes glaze over. And I know that because I've spent a lot of time trying to talk to them about these things. Um, so, so they come to me and they say, just give me rules. Give me rules, tell me what I have to do and what I can't do. And I'm like, well, it's, it's contextual and it's nuanced. And they're just like, stop it. I just want rules. Um, what we've tried to do is satisfy that tendency, but also give them the training to where they understand that the rules aren't going to solve all the problems. Let's identify the high risk problem. And then there are people like me at the company that can help them work through those high risk problems. Okay. Unfortunately, we've created an environment that, that kind of lends itself to people thinking the wrong way about privacy. We've got prescriptive data protection compliance laws that's, that, that really, you know, that. They've, they've done a very good job of creating an environment where people understand the concept of data protection, but they've, they've kind of trained people to think about it the wrong way, right? So I spend a whole lot of time deprogramming the people that I work with in the company, not at least the lawyers that I work with in the company, right? Because what happens traditionally is you build the product and then you go to the legal team and you say, write me a privacy policy and you give me a set of terms and conditions and then we're fine, right? And at that point, I'm like, well, you've already built the product, that's really, okay, well, how, how, I, I can't solve this with a set of legal terms. We're going to have to go back and think about this. What we've done at Vodafone is try to create a program that deprograms the, the lawyers and the, and the software developers and the engineers and, the, and the, the commercial guys to think about privacy as something that, that has to be embedded from the beginning. So the way that we've done that is with the Vodafone Privacy Program. It's a couple of interoperating elements that get people thinking about privacy differently. There are, of course, operational rules, and that's in our operational privacy risk management system. That's things like privacy impact assessments. It's um, things like vendor management, and things, things, things like um, 
roles in de-identification and data minimization and elements of like that. But then there's also the privacy commitments. And those are principles and not rules. There are seven very high level ways that are conveyed across the company to everybody about how we think about privacy. These are in our code of conduct. They're, um, you know, everybody in the company is supposed to understand that this is how this works, right? Getting them thinking about privacy differently. This is not a set of legal obligations. It is a business value that we're all expected to move up to. We encourage that through training, of course. We've got um, some, some tailored training that goes out to different audiences within the company to talk about them with respect to the things that, that they should be interested in. We have specifically privacy by design training, and it's scenarios based, right? So here's a scenario that we want you to interact with and we want you to be able to understand how to identify the privacy risks in this scenario. We've got other training modules, things about privacy and human rights um, for the people who make decisions about how they interact with law enforcement, for example. This is the privacy by design module. It's supposed to be bite-sized, right? We're, we're not trying to teach everybody everything that they need to know about privacy and data protection and legal compliance. We're trying to teach them how to, how to, how to issue spot, basically, and, and to know when there's an issue that they should be talking to someone like about. We also try to do a very simplified privacy impact assessment. So this is a tool that anybody in the company can go to if they've got a, you know, at the very initial stages of product development, they're sent to the privacy wizard. They answer, I think there are eight really high level questions that goes through um, some, some you know, question and answer management to apply a risk score. And if that risk score is high enough, then it sends an alert to my team or one of the, uh, our, our local carriers privacy teams to then get involved in the product development and do that hand holding like I talked about at the beginning. And then of course we do think that the regulation has a role to play. The new data protection regulation really should create a kind of framework where we can take it out of the hands of, you know, I, I am a lawyer, don't, don't take this the wrong way, but take it out of the hands of the lawyers um, and put it back into place as an element of business operations and people making the decisions that aren't, you know, gonna go to the lawyers and say, fix this please, um, you know, they're gonna be making the right decisions. But we think with a little bit of flexibility and a whole lot of accountability, and you know, I, I, this is where I differ from a lot of the other major companies here, strong sanctions, right? Give us the flexibility to make the calls about money that we need to do. Um, and then if we get it wrong, smack us down. Right, on that note, <laughs> uh, we'll move on to, to Dr. Gerson Fridwell. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk mainly about the commercialization of privacy by design. Uh, my work has uh, been largely focused on uh, consumer surveillance issues and marketing practices, uh, increasingly looking at how this is connected to the use of new media. Um, and so the, the question that I raised or thought for myself for this presentation um, was what does the commercialization of uh, privacy by design specific look like and how does that happen in practice? Um, I guess there's other uh, questions uh, for this uh, panel this session. I kind of boiled it down and I have an answer. My answer is I don't know. Um, I'm the lone academic on this panel and um, uh, unless you think that uh, we're sitting in our ivory towers, of course, um, thinking through these things. Uh, these are concerns that uh, I and uh, the students that I've been working with uh, have been examining, most often in relation to the treasure trove of data that comes from new and social media. So what I know is that the answer to that... Should I? Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. Um, the answer to that question um, is how is a design... Uh, how... Um, yeah? Okay. Oh, oh, okay. It doesn't matter. Um, um, is that there's a whole number of different pieces that are connected to um, uh, um, how, how we think about the commercialization of um, um, uh, privacy by design. Now, first, there is, of course, a value and definition of privacy, and that matters. So how are we approaching the question of privacy for you know, organizations that are actually um, involved in this? Uh, are they talking about privacy in terms of autonomy? 
They're talking about control, or they're talking about security of information. Is it about data processing? Um, and then, of course, this is connected to human behavior. Uh, often this is seen as the weak link in uh, privacy practices at work. Uh, how often are our employees uh, you know, willing to share and give data when they may or may not um, be allowed to? Um, this is, of course, connected to technological artifacts. Most of the time, when we are talking about privacy for any company, uh, we don't recognize that there are legacy systems that have to be dealt with. Um, the integration of those uh, the information that's available in these legacy systems is incredibly uh, hard work, and there's significant resource limitations. Of course, it's not just the artifacts, it's not just the physical things, it's actually the processes themselves. Uh, I had a student who was looking at, at segmentation practices. Um, uh, and he uh, spoke with a number of people in very large uh, data processing organizations in Europe and uh, in the US. Um, and interestingly, these are companies that still, uh, you know, in 2014, when he was doing his research, make no use of social media data. Uh, they're still reliant on things like magazine subscription data, for instance. And so we may presume that new and social media actually has changed the landscape, but uh, in fact, some of the processes of data collection and use is, a, is a not at all connected to uh, what we might assume. Of course, this is connected to systems and patterns of work. Uh, uh, John just mentioned the adoption problem. Um, how is uh, how are the ways in which work is happening um, affecting and connected to the question of privacy? I believe Casey's example there um, was to suggest that Vodafone itself is starting to change those systems and patterns. Uh, of course, there are regulatory desires and requirements. Um, and, I, and I say there are requirements, of course, but there's also desires, because in practice, oftentimes, um, what we might hope for and expect doesn't. Um, I had a, a person working on a, uh, with some smaller organizations, she looked at a headhunting organization. There were about three or four employees, and they had hundreds of uh, sort of data sets personal information of uh, potential clients, um, potential uh, people to move from one business to another. Um, and uh, uh, they said that when they were requested to delete their profile, so if somebody was a, a client of this uh, headhunting organization um, and they wanted to have their profile deleted, they would put it in a file that was, which was to be deleted, but never would actually delete it. And they did that for a couple of reasons. Um, one is they had some legal concerns about their own history with these people. Um, and secondly, they often found that those same people you know, changed their mind and said, no, no, we do want to use your services. What do you mean you deleted our file? Um, we'll talk about that. I'll talk about that in a second. This is connected, of course, to end user expectations um, and demands. Um, and then uh, corporate motivations, uh, of course, uh, by and large, we're talking about the commercialization of privacy by design. There is a profit motive uh, still. So how do all of these pieces uh, connect together? How do they come to produce a relevant set of practices and ensure fundamental rights of persons are respected, including privacy? Um, we can't actually easily separate out uh, privacy in these uh, contexts. We can, we can do it analytically, and we can do it um, perhaps linguistically with our language, but not in practice. It doesn't work. Uh, privacy is a part of all of those different uh, And so what we end up seeing is um, that there are multiple, multiple, um, yeah, multiple um, uh, configurations. There's, you know, when, you, when you put all of those different pieces together, and uh, there's probably more than I listed, you have an exponential set of arrangements, variations in all of those different sets of practices, uh, different uh, sort of components of how um, an organization comes together, uh, changes and affects the way in which privacy uh, happens. Now, and more often than not, uh, privacy is uh, still, unfortunately, an afterthought. And this is where privacy policies, data protection frameworks, uh, things like pets actually come in. And they're uh, an attempt to sort of mitigate this and ensure, um, uh, ensure that uh, privacy is, again, uh, respected. That's where we end up with uh, this notion of privacy. 
But the question, other question that I want to ask is, um, when we talk about privacy by design, we actually need to ask what uh, privacy by design we're talking about. So I assume that even in this room, there are uh, a number of us who uh, might default to the working 29 definition, or we might talk about um, Anne Kabukin's list of seven principles. Um, so, uh, uh, but I think actually we would all come up with sort of slightly different um, uh, sort of emphases in privacy by design. Uh, a few years ago, uh, State of Curses and uh, Irma van der Ploeg and I came up with a paper that said, um, looking more specifically at identification, uh, identity management systems, um, but how privacy by design uh, ends up being worked out in practice. Uh, and we came up with sort of three typical um, ways in which this happens. One was this notion of sort of preemptive privacy by design. It focuses on data confidentiality and how the security of data is uh, transferred. Typically, uh, this tends to be a systems engineering perspective. It's focused on ensuring that information is impenetrable from outside entities that seek that information. So in order to keep data private, um, you end up reducing data capture or using cryptography, um, again, as Pet's definition to try to get to anonymity, unlinkability, unobservability. Um, now, often, actually, uh, this isn't always seen as privacy design uh, initially. Rather, it's a sort of a process in which we're really trying to secure data, and actually privacy is, 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 is a part of that, but not the sort of central point. Um, of course, what we tend to know here is this notion of um, compliance and uh, beyond uh, compliance and beyond privacy by design it tends to be a more regulatory uh, focus. The issue is the data, we need to protect data. We need to detect, um, we need to protect data processing. Uh, so it's not about ensuring uh, data protection uh, finds it's about fair use and analysis. Of and then a last uh, sort of uh, uh, way in which typically privacy by design is approached is one that is more focused on user centricity. And that's really about selling privacy to the consumer um, directly. Um, and, and this is a translation, this is an interpretation that actually users need to be responsible for their own data. Um, and what uh, this perspective tends to do is provide simplified solutions that empower and enable consumers to re reveal and conceal the information they want in the context of their choice. Uh, so again, establishing secure personal identities uh, and digital attributes um, uh, uh, that if the, two, if the user chooses, um, can be deleted. So why bring these three different orientations of privacy by design up? And I want to suggest to you that how a problem is defined, um, how privacy by design is defined, is determinative of how uh, the problems or issues can or will be resolved. A privacy by design that emphasizes data security um, is going to invariably focus on technical solutions, potentially uh, to the detriment of more deeply embedding privacy into practice. Um, a compliance approach might, uh, you know, stifle innovations, has always been a concern and argument, but it might promote it in others, while a user-centric approach uh, allows control for consumers. However, as we know, most consumers may be overwhelmed by the choices of Certain people are aware of cookies and the way this influences their behavior on the internet. Um, certain people have adjusted their settings on Facebook, limited access to applications on smartphones, written letters to their governmental representatives. There are certain people that care about privacy. Certainly this is increasing, uh, but to make this a commercial su success I think is a struggle. Um, I think that privacy as a differentiator for uh, Commercial success has always been and remains limited. Okay. Um, and so uh, we need to talk about transparency um, of in terms of consumer data, which is itself a double-edged sword. If our goal is to increase trust and brand trust and loyalty, that often produces the opposite effect when people know what uh, organizations are doing with information. Um, and so we need to talk about how. Uh, 
I'm interested in talking about how we can transform and change the role of those pieces, how they're configured. So I, I came up with a couple of potential factors for success. And uh, these are, again, I say question mark because uh, these are things that I have seen in my own research and my research of the students that I've been working with. So I think we need to consider the entirety of the configuration. How are all those pieces coming together? Uh, and examine the way in which people and technology are relating to each other. Uh, I did an interview with uh, an organization uh, several years ago who, who uh, decided to cut the number of questions, the number of uh, personal information attributes they were asking of their customers. Um, because they found that when they had several screens in a row which was asking personal information, people would drop out of the process. And so they realized that they needed to cut back on those questions. And so they shortened those rather considerably, not because of privacy, but because it's actually made more business sense. Um, and the two other sort of points that I want to bring up here is that we need to recognize the limitations of consumers. Uh, we may produce uh, lots of research, which uh, was alluded to earlier, that says we really care, you know, consumers really care about uh, privacy. But those contexts, those interviews, those um, uh, surveys are done on a very different uh, um, uh, set of arrangements than when actually consumers decide to uh, actually make uh, purchase decisions. So context matters, and context changes the success of embedded privacy. And last is simply there is no one size fits all solution. And I think that uh, privacy by design, especially for commercial success, has to be done on a case by case basis. Okay, <coughs> thank you Jason. I'm going to hand you over to our moderator, Jeff. Um, we might run a few minutes into the coffee break if we were forced to start 15 minutes late, but only five minutes or so, so we've got 10, 15 minutes um, for some comments and for some questions. Um, just won't miss any sessions. Um, Right, I'll try and um, I'll try and maximise discussion time, um, so I'll keep these remarks down to about five minutes if I can. Um, this is a terrific set of papers. I really enjoyed it and found lots of common themes across them. Um, as I talk, I'm going to I'm going to go through each paper serially, um, but I'm going to highlight two themes uh, that really stood out for me among the uh, among the set of them. One is the theme of uh, temporality, and the other is the theme of abstraction. Um, and they'll become a little bit clearer, um, hopefully, as I talk. Um, in John's presentation, I was extremely interested um, in uh, the statement, well, we're building ethical principles into machines for the first time ever. Um, and that sort of made me wonder, um, you know, what is the ontology that we're dealing with here? Where are we coding the design into? Are we physically wiring it into the hardware? Um, is it part of the software? Um, is it, um, you know, what's the distribution of decisions that we make in order to make this, um, in order to really make this work? I'm involved right now, for example, in a project on the future internet architecture uh, for the United States, and the FIA projects, uh, systems architects don't really realize that, that they're doing <coughs> policy work in privacy, and that's absolutely central to them. Um, a temporality issue that came up in John's, but Jason also uh, brought out to some extent. Um, how are people's attitudes changing towards privacy? Uh, we, we seem to have, to some extent, privacy as, um, you know, a, a, as a fixed quantity. Um, but I think it's clearly changing over time. How do we recognize that? How do we design for it? How do we build into it? Um, let's see. OK. Tom. Um, Tom's talk, I really, really love the, um, um, you know, this design from the edge, um, this design from the edge um, example. Um, I'd love to hear some more examples uh, from Tom of, um, you know, where is the edge on privacy and how exactly do you design from it? This, this move to design from the edge is really big in, in lots of startups in Silicon Valley. So I think it's, you know, it's, it, it's very good across the board. Um, one of the interesting areas always um, when you're looking at the edge is, um, and you, met, you brought up blockchain under Bitcoin, um, is the illegal practices. You know, people want to be shady. Um, how do you find out about how people are being effectively shady um, and how do you bring that um, into a good design environment? Um, uh, Tom also brought up the, um, 
The issue, I mean, the issue of what exactly is the commercial model here? Um, how do you change the mindset? Um, and as with John, he brought up the issue of the adoption curve there. So we know that there's going to be a very difficult and long adoption curve um, for lots of these products. Uh, how do we recognize that and design for it? Um, in Casey's, uh, Casey's talk, uh, again, I really you know, love the description of net perform, for example. Um, a temporal issue on that for me is um, how can you provide reminders to people of what, dis what privacy decisions they've taken? Because I might take, make a decision um, you know, in haste while I'm installing a bit of software, and then three months later I've got no idea what I've decided to do. Or maybe my attitudes are changing as I'm going along, so how exactly um, am I reminded and told, well, given that your attitudes may have changed, have you actually thought, um, thought differently? Um, Casey brought up the problem of there ain't no simple rules, uh, which was, um, you know, don't be afraid of ambiguity, as she said. Um, this is very similar to the, um, to the um, issues that John brought up uh, about, um, about the ontologies that we're dealing with. There are no clearly, there are no clear ontologies here. Um, so how exactly do you deal and play with that? Um, there was the issue of, and again, another temporality issue, I'll come back to ambiguity in a second if we've got time. Um, where do you build this stuff in? Um, one of my favorite works of recent, uh, re last couple of years has been uh, by Steve Jackson and Tarleton Gillespie called The Design Policy Knot. Um, and in The Design Policy Knot, they argue that we need the policy makers in there with the, the designers at the same time. Uh, what we seem to have a little bit of across these talks, which was, which was interesting from my point of view, um, was policy was not seen as a changing quantity, as something that itself moved over time. Um, how you decided, um, to some extent Jason brought this out, how you decided whether an issue was an issue of design, of policy, or of behavior and attitudes of the individual patrons. Um, so how do you distribute the design issue? The, 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 design, the, you know, the design space, the design landscape, includes each of those three. Um, so how do you design for, you know, how do you decide the distribution of qualities between the three of them and how you, how you define where they are? Um, you know, Tom also, on the temporality side, brought out the issue of, um, of design as, uh, as an afterthought. Uh, Jason's talk, um, all right, I'm, I'm going to um, bring, in, bring in something slightly tangential. Uh, again, um, he said we often don't re recognize legacy systems. Um, it does remind me that we often don't think about, when we make privacy decisions, we make decisions about what we're feeling about right now, not what's going to happen in 10 or 15 years. Uh, there are classic cases of misuse of census data during World War II to identify, um, you know, to identify Jews in, in Holland. Uh, one of the reasons the Nazis were really able to do it was because the very good databases kept by the you know, Social Democrat the Dutch government. They trusted their government at that time. Do you trust your government? Do you trust those decisions for the long term? And what kind of fail-safes uh, can you put in for the long term? Um, finally, uh, just to give maximum time for folks to talk, um, I was a little bit surprised that we didn't get much on contextual privacy, um, Hello and Nissenbaum's concept there. Um, privacy is not a single universal thing, uh, it really is context, context dependent. And one of the problems with context dependent privacy is, well, take, uh, all right, two points. Uh, take 23andMe, which was brought up by one of the speakers. 23andMe, it ain't just my privacy that I'm giving away or dealing with there. It's other people's privacy as well. It's other people who share my genome. And I think this absolutely insufficient attention um, is paid to that. Uh, and my partner um, did 23andMe, found she, had a, uh, found she had a condition of a certain kind. Of course, well, did she then have the duty to tell her sister and her sister's children about what happened? And what did it mean that she was making a privacy decision about herself that affected her whole, um, her whole family? Um, actually, I'm going to stop there because I really do want to maximize time for talking about Fantastic series of talks, really brought out, I think, some of the major issues in the field. So, thank you for the speakers. Um, I believe, as moderator, I will take questions. Yeah. Jeff, I'm very, very pleased that you made this last remark about the DNA and the genetic. 
that really needs to be emphasized in those contexts. But the question I really want to ask um, is, uh, Casey, you mentioned um, in your thing about the principles and you mentioned accountability. I'm very interested in accountability and I want you to know, uh, first of all, what Vodafone means by it, how they make it manifest, what they do about it, because it is a very fine word, and as you will know, these days it's being played, played quite a bit and will appear in the data protection regulation. What, what do you mean by it, and, and how, do you, how do you show that you are accountable? To whom do you show it, and when? So it's a very good question. Um, we throw this term around a lot in privacy. What do we mean by it? Our commitment to accountability talks about how we will make ourselves live up to the commitments that we've made in our privacy commitments, right? So this is something that we will show that we're embedding within the company and where possible when we're working with partners and vendors and, and other participants in the mobile ecosystem and in our industry, we will we will take steps to make sure that they're living up to it as well. Now the way that we demonstrate that is well, what we've built up until now is a report in our it's part of our sustainability report. Um, if you go to vodafone.com slash privacy, you'll see in the Privacy Center a link to the yearly sustainability report. And that report, um, there, there's a section of it that outlines our program in general and what we've built that creates that framework within the company that makes sure that we're living up to our privacy commitments. And then there's a yearly report on the progress we've made against that framework. That sustainability report is then vetted by external auditors so we work with Ernst & Young, goes through and examines our programs to make sure that the commitments that we've made in the sustainability report are accurate and complete. That's what we've managed to build so far, and it, I think that it works for us. Of course, we're always looking for ways to improve. So if you have other ideas, I'd love to hear them. Okay. Any other questions, comments? We completely solve all of the issues. <laughs> I have a question. I, I, I would love to talk to Tom maybe about that building from the outside in, right? The, looking for the edge cases because it, it's a little different from what we found in our. We, we did three years of consumer research to come up with the structure that created the information. Break in five minutes, please. And what we found was building for the edge cases is actually a little dangerous, right? I spent a lot of time talking to my developers about how they are not a representative sample of our. Um, and of course, you know, we, we, we broke things down by things like the Western segments, right? So the, all of the, the unconcerned and the pragmatists and, and the, the fundamentalists, right? Um, to try to find the sweet spot. And what we found is, is that defaults on the choices that you make with the information manager really should depend on not necessarily the edge cases, but what would most people choose to do if they were presented with this, right? So when we're talking about privacy as a product, I agree finding the solutions that the super users are looking for can be useful in coming up with a business model. But when you're talking about programs of general applicability, it can be a dangerous way to think about it. I, I, I just, I want to throw the, that out there as sort of two different perspectives because I think it works in some cases and not at all. Yeah. I think you're right, it works in some cases, not in all, but um, have you come across a company called IDEO, IDEO, the product design company? Um, we worked a lot with them when we were building a, the, the online uh, uh, bank in the UK, and their approach is very ethnographic, it's very observational, and it, it is very much geared towards looking at what's happening at the extremes. Um, particularly in new areas, because in, in, in areas that are sort of well established, you, you, can, you can sort of rely on the mass consumer to, to tell you where they want to be and do they want to be slightly here or there. But if you're trying to get a new area, you need some quite sharp propositions you know, that, that really sort of hook people, and then you need to get behind those propositions. And sometimes to find those sort of sharp propositions that will hook people, you have to go to the edge. So that's that's where it comes from in, in my thinking. But but there are you know there are multiple ways of looking at it for sure. Mm. Uh, then, yeah, John. Well, just what I wanted to make as an expert in mark is uh, and the time is very limited, is that what we um, we found out is that there are two approaches to the what the privacy problem. You can do it from the individual, protect its privacy, its data, 
but we, we didn't find a very good, uh, um, a successful way of, uh, of approaching privacy. So we returned uh, the question and said, if there are rights for the individual, there are also duties for the ones who have to protect the privacy of the individual, so the organizations. And that approach from the organizations helped very much in calculating better what would be, for example, return investment. But it's, it's a, you have to, mostly we don't approach privacy from the, uh, the obligation side of the, of the problem. And, and just forget it, but that would help very much to see the other side of the problem. And uh, that, uh, that, 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 that should be done more, I think, in order to solve more of these parts of the problem. Now, we're getting towards the end here. Oh, we finally have some questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do uh, there are three comments questions. I've seen many, many, many. Um, Can you do them very quickly? And then I'm going to give the panelists a chance to respond uh, collectively or separately to, to them as they see fit. So, so you, you've been waiting on this. Yeah, I have a question to Tom, because I was interested about these uh, uh, projects that you have to investigate in the UK. Uh, where there are also projects uh, around the energy sector and specifically around smart meters that could be uh, uh, let's say a neighbor for the consumer. That's a fantastic question. Yeah. Uh, I've been doing very good the facilities. I'm wondering if, uh, when you're working on a privacy, for example, the increase of privacy engineering, um, there's a lot of technical issues that can or can't solve the privacy issues, so then you would have to with legal and accountability issues and stuff like that. What I've found is always kind of hard in the project to really enforce the legal and the organizational stuff, especially if it's an internal and you want to make the system work. If someone messes up somewhere, you know, you're know you not going to uh, give them full accountability and enforcement or whatever you call it. So do you, are there any best practices that you know that way you use these soft tools instead of hard tools to really make sure people follow procedures or you know, the right things to and uh, excuse me, you had a question? Yeah. Um, my question is uh, also for Tom. Uh, you said that uh, people don't pay for privacy, and that's what this is uh, thing. Or this is thing that people don't pay for privacy, so they don't invest in private products. But people are paying now for reputation management on the internet, and this is uh, investing in uh, reputation management uh, projects, which are afterwards uh, solution to privacy. So are we just uh, failing on the marketing side? Maybe we are not marketing privacy correctly. OK, that's great. Um, I'm going to put Tom on the um, uh, Tom up first, uh, because two of the questions were directed to him. But then I'm going to invite each of the panelists for a very quick final thought. A witty Mo or Aphorism would be wonderful. <laughs> OK, I'll, I'll be very quick and, and probably give my final thought at the same time. Yes. Um, uh, energy projects, there is a lot of research uh, that seems to be going on around the internet of things. So I think, I, I can't think of one of the projects that's specifically energy, but I think it would be worth looking at some of those. So I'll, I'll give you access and you, you can have a look and see what's, see what's in there. Um, the marketing point, I think, is a really interesting one because I think that there's a problem with language at the moment. If you sit down with consumers and say the word privacy, then they, they're immediately, they'll probably sit up straight and behave themselves because it's a loaded word. We, again, in the financial sector, when we did research and we got consumers together and said we're going to talk about banking, they would tell you what they thought their bank manager would want to hear. If you said to them, we're going to talk about money, they'd say, oh, money, you know, and you know, you'd just get a different conversation. Privacy is a loaded word for consumers and it's very loaded for investors uh, as well. So I think you're right that something around the marketing of what we're doing uh, and thinking about the language is, is really important. I guess my final thought is the, related to the adoption curve. When you're doing startup stuff, you have one or two years to make an impact. So one year you've got to do something and then a year after that you've got to do something big, otherwise your investor is going to fall behind. Time for a break, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we need strategic investors to get involved with startups to put some money in with longer time scales. Jason? I think my only concern is about the autonomous thinking that there's an organizational side and that there's a consumer side or that these are either somehow separated. I think it's a lot more um, blended than that. And I think there's a problem with thinking about one side versus another rather than the whole thing. Thank you.